Good afternoon. Come on. Good afternoon. All right. Where's uh, Where's my mayor? Is he here, Ryan? Where are you at? Is Mayor Ryan here from Elsa? No. Okay. We're. I was told he might be in attendance. Hopefully, he'll sneak in later. Well, I understand my contributions last year changed the economic numbers for the bourbon industry. Did you see where they took over beer as the... Sorry. Okay. First off, we wish our scheduled speaker, Thomas Wallstrom, a speedy recovery. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else here has had any staff illness issues, call-offs the last three weeks. It's been brutal at my shop, so... Anybody else have any issues with a lot of sick employees calling off? No? Just Michael? Okay. All right. It uh, gives me great pleasure to announce in Thomas's place we have David Apadal, who is the policy advisor in the Economic Research Department at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. David conducts research on agricultural sector, sector and rural development as well as analyzes business conditions and the regional economy. He directs the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago survey of, excuse me, survey of agricultural banks on agricultural land values and credit conditions, and publishes the results in Ag Letter, the Chicago Fed's quarterly agricultural publication. In addition to his research, he monitors the regional economy through round roundtables and other contacts, briefs senior staff on the agricultural economy and organizes the annual agricultural conference. You're a busy guy. <laughs> Before starting his career at the Chicago Fed as an associate economist in 1998, Apadal was a consultant in the economic research department at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas. While at the Dallas Fed, he provided research support in the area of econometrics he also received the B.S. in Mathematics from Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and an M.S. in Statistics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He also completed graduate-level coursework in Economics while attending Southern Methodist University. Put your hands together. Join me in welcoming David. Thank you, sir. Well, it's great to be down here in uh, the Alsip area. I appreciate a uh, great organization that you all are part of here. The CAIC is uh, doing great work, and it's good to hear a lot of the stories that uh, you're sharing. And it's um, my privilege to share a little bit about the economic outlook of the U.S. and the Midwest with you, as Tom was not able to be here, and he is doing all right, but uh, he'll be back to work probably next week. So it's just uh, you know one of the things you do, you help each other out. And so I'm here and our boss is going to be up in Lake County, Illinois and covering another one of his talks. So um, we're just um, having to kind of make do and hopefully I will um, be able to cover the material in a manner that does him justice. So I added some of my own slides but I'm also using some of his and I just wanted to start out with, uh, you know, sorry some of you guys in the corners aren't maybe going to be able to see this, but this is the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, which tracks 85 monthly indicators and combines them into one number. And why do I like to focus on this? Well, because it's kind of like the pulse of the economy. You know, when you go to the doctor or you want to check how your heart's doing, you take your pulse. And this one number kind of gives you a feel for what the U.S. economy is doing on a monthly basis. It's um, taking those 85 indicators and kind of uses some fancy statistics to crunch them down. And if it's zero, that means it's around the trend growth rate of the economy, which is slightly under 2% in the long term. If it's above trend, then it's going to be positive. And if it's below trend, it's negative. And as you can see in the far... Um, left side of this chart, it was extremely negative in early 2020. And that was when we had, of course, our little COVID recession that was so traumatic for the United States. And so that short recession, you know, the indicators showed, you know, everything went down. But then what happened right after that? Everything went up and we had a huge recovery as the economy started to reopen 
And so it was just that two-month window when we had a really tough time in terms of the um, overall economy. Obviously, there are many stories about continuing economic troubles in the recovery period. But really, since then, we've been in a recovery. As you can see, there might be a month or two where we had a tougher time. But as long as it doesn't get down below minus one, then it's not really as you know tough relatively. And if you go back further, that you know in this data, it could go a lot further back and talk about the Great Recession in 2008 and 9, and that was another tough one, but not nearly as deep as the one in um, early 2020. But the recovery took a lot longer that time. And so when you look at that. In the last couple of years, it's hard to see in that, in that first line there. So I wanted to kind of zoom in and, and look at the last year here, and we can kind of see that sometimes we've had you know, pretty decent growth, a little bit over one half of the measure. So anything above zero, remember, is a growing economy or in a, above trend. Um, at zero, then you're at trend growth. And so we had a few um, months where it's been a little negative, but at the same time, um, at the end of last year was when it kind of got a little more negative. And it, so we do see a slowdown in growth in this indicator um, at the end of the year. Almost all the subsectors, which you can see the red one is production and income, then the kind of the tan beige is sales, orders, and inventories. The, um, blue one is employment, unemployment, and hours, and then the kind of um, teal one is personal consumption and housing. So we, we have seen a slowdown in the last couple months, and January we don't have a read on yet, but um, you know, we'll see what happened there. Obviously, um, the, income, or the in income and employment was kind of positive in um, January when you look at the numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics because we had over 500,000 jobs created by the economy. That was a surprise that it was that large. Um, but you see a lot of the service sectors that have maybe struggled a lot over the last few years, they're starting to kind of return to more normal activity. Um, people are starting to travel a little more. Um, we were trying to book flights down to Scottsdale to see my brother in March, and it's getting a little pricey. So um, we'll see how, you know, we, we do have our tickets, so I will be going down there. But certainly um, there's, there's a lot happening in this um, economy right now. And one of the factors that's involved with the little bit of slowdown we've seen, of course, is what's the, you know, the policy of the Federal Reserve on interest rates. So you think about how the economy was um, entering the COVID recession, and it was you know, very tough times. And so interest rates were dropped again to about zero um, in the Fed funds rate target. And it stayed that way until last year. And then when inflation started taking off, we had to start um, responding to that. And it kept taking off. So we've kept raising the interest rate target. And it's now a four and a half to four and three quarters range. So it's uh, much higher than it had been, um, even compared to um, the earlier increase from about 2016 to 2020. And that was, um, you know, didn't cut nearly this large. But when you look at what's happening with the, um, you know, the longer term picture, we still have relatively moderate interest rates. They're not up to the levels that we saw um, back in the 90s or earlier, as this chart shows. But certainly they're rising closer to some of those peaks we've seen since that time. And the uh, continuation of those increases is something that I'm sure is on everyone's minds in the business community. So that's, that's a, a key component of what's happening. But at the same time, there's a lot of um, support from other parts of the business community right now. If you look at manufacturing, um, you know, the supply chain's pressures have eased. You can see that in terms of delivery times, in terms of parts getting in on more of a regular basis, and maybe some companies are not over-ordering parts because now just-in-time is becoming more like just-in-time should be instead of being just in case when you over ordered things. So those are some of those kinds of pressures that maybe are helping to return profitability. And one of the ways to measure this, the New York Fed has come up with a global supply chain pressure index. And you can see that in 2000, 
21, it really shot up and then it um, has eased since that time. So we're starting to see some of those easing pressures helping manufacturing. Uh, when you think about the industrial production measure that adds all manufacturing together into one number, um, you can see that you know the dip down in 2020 and then a slow recovery you know, since then until the end of last year, kind of a dip down in the manufacturing. That's the blue line here. And then when you think about motor vehicles, it's, uh, you know, that's part of the manufacturing story, just that they couldn't produce enough motor vehicles during the pandemic. Um, we had shortages of chips and other materials. And so there was the rapid decline and then a big pickup in motor vehicle industrial production, but then it had to um, tail off as the parts supplies and the supply chain story was restricting output. And then in last year, you started to see some recovery there until the end of the year as well. So, so there, there was a dip in manufacturing towards the end of 2022, and, and that does cause some concern. As, you know, obviously, interest rate increases are affecting manufacturing as well. And one of the factors that you have to keep in mind is that fiscal stimulus is continuing to kind of um, give the economy some support. And, you know, it's been a um, very unusual period where we had very large um, stimulus um, payments from the federal government to states, from the federal government to individuals, and that boosted personal savings rates dramatically during the um, you know, the early part of the recession and, and you know, you, you didn't have any place to spend the money, so you saved it. And then as the economy started to open up, you could start spending more. And of course, a lot of that was on goods. People, you know, were able to stock up, remodel their homes. You know, you had lots of um, people wanting a bigger TV because they're stuck at home so long. And so there are lots of um, different stories about goods activity picking up dramatically. And then, but still the fiscal stimulus was pretty strong. And now the personal savings rate you can see tailing off in 2022, and it got a lot lower because people had been spending what they had saved up, and so um, they weren't able to save as much. But now they're getting to the point where they're starting to think about saving more. And according to the S&P Global forecast, the savings rate should be rising over the next couple of years. So that's... Uh, Kind of one of the stories I think that's helped to keep consumption quite strong during the recovery period. And the last couple of years now, maybe it's starting to um, be a little softer, especially the goods side of um, consumption has been falling. Services still seems to be um, recovering and growing up a little bit. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a challenging time to kind of know exactly what's gonna be happening, but certainly that um, stimulus has um, helped to get us through the worst of COVID in, on effect on the economy. But at the same time, now the stimulus is um, waning as you know the government money is being used up and then the Federal Reserve has started to raise interest rates. And when you think about the growth, it's, it's slowed, but certainly it's still positive. Um, at this point, and hopefully we won't have a recession, but that is a possibility, and a lot of um, economists are expecting that this year. Um, and, and this forecast from S&P Global shows a little bit of a, a downturn in the um, first quarter of this year. At the same time, there's still some positive, um, you know, aspects. I mentioned employment still quite strong, so that's something. We'll talk about a bit more in a minute, but there, there are a lot of risks to the downside in terms of inflation remaining um, you know, high. It, it does seem like it's easing, but how quickly that will happen is a question mark. And then, of course, we've had some war in Europe with um, Russia attacking Ukraine, and that's um, certainly a tough thing for the world economy, and we'll have to monitor that, although markets have kind of settled down after the initial year of um, you know, has gone through, and um, we'll see if that maintains. And of course, the other um, risk to that downside would be another large COVID wave, which certainly um, seems like it won't impact us the same way the initial one did, just because the virulence of the disease is not as nasty, even though it can be um, still um, very debilitating. So, so there are some positives. Um, and, but there are also some risks that we have to be thinking about. And so the 
chance of a uh, recession is there. Um, longer run increase in the economy should be about 1.8 percent. And so we'll be under that this year, according to the S&P global forecast, 1.1 percent. So um, slow growth. So that's, you know, that initial Chicago Fed National Activity Index will probably be a little negative over this year just because it's going to be slow growth and it wouldn't be above trend growth like we've seen much of during the recovery. So what's leading to that um, specifically is uh, a lot of it is driven by investment falling. If you look at here at the chart, you can see the different um, aspects of, invest of the economic growth. Um, the investment is the reddish line. Consumption is blue, which is looking to stay mostly positive um, over the next couple of years, according to the S&P global forecast. But then the um, investment is kind of um, strongly negative for the, a few um, quarters here before it starts to be positive again later in this year. One of the other aspects that's been pretty positive lately has been government spending. Governments, especially state and local governments, have a lot of funds that came through the stimulus that haven't, you know, it takes time to work things through. We have an infrastructure bill that was passed, so there's going to be some additional s stimulus coming through from that. And so that's um, still a, a positive in many quarters, but not obviously all of them, as you can see um, back in 2022. And then net exports have actually been a positive for the U.S. economy in um, most of the quarters recently. So it's, uh, you know, so, so those positive contributions are continuing, but when you um, look at the investment side, one of the key components of the investment is the housing, and housing markets have been under a lot of challenge in 2022 as interest rates rose. In this chart, you can see they rose up to levels they hadn't been at since 2000. And so there um, was a very rapid increase there along with the increase that occurred in the Fed funds rate and a lot of other interest rates. And so then naturally when people are looking to buy a home and the price goes up um, pretty dramatically because the mortgage is much higher and more costly, that's going to slow down the um, housing sector and probably um, it, you can make a good argument that they have been in a recessionary period in terms of the housing side even though most of the rest of the economy has kept moving forward. And as you can see here a little bit at the very end, we, we did have some relief in terms of mortgage rates towards the end of 2022 and into early 2023. So interest rates, um, though still higher, are not super high. They, they haven't risen to levels that were um, back in the 90s or earlier. So we still have um, a situation that as people get readjusted to their thinking. If, you, if you're thinking about getting a 3% interest rate on a mortgage, now when you're facing a, you know, a 7% rate, that's a huge, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's massive increase. And so, but, it, but now maybe people can start thinking about that we're probably going to have interest rates in the 6 to 7% range. And so it's not um, as um, damaging maybe for the housing markets going into this year just because people can reassess and um, maybe there and there has been some decrease in home prices in certain parts of the country particularly um, and so that can kind of help reset that market but we still need more housing in many areas of the country and it's you know it's just not being built as rapidly as it was in the early part of the recovery when it was a boom again so housing, residential um, investment is a big part of what's happened with the investment components. Um, you can see that red part there, and then business fixed investment is the blue in this chart, and that's been a little positive um, you know, in 2022, but at the same time, a little more negative right now is the expectation before it moves positive again and in, into 2024. And so interest rates being down a little bit has helped there but at the same time the fed funds rate target is still continuing to move up and so that we'll see how that works out um, going forward so one of the other sectors i mentioned that's so important is consumption um, you know almost three quarters of the u.s economy is based on consumption and so that's a huge part of what 
you know, boosts economic activity. And there you have a lot of um, sensitivity to interest rates with, you know, durable goods, particularly cars with auto loans having to be more expensive. And so there's some pullback there, even though there was a lot of um, buildup of, you know, people that couldn't get a car during COVID, and then they now are being able to deliver those more um, regularly. And so there's, there is some um, challenge there for that sector, as I had already showed. Um, but at the same time, the service industries in particular are the ones that are continuing to move things forward in consumption. And so um, services is the blue part of this chart, and it shows pretty positive numbers um, for this year and next year. And so it's anticip you know, the anticipation would be that services continues to be a driver as our economy really shifted from being a goods-based economy um, over the long term to a service-based economy with a little blip there during COVID when goods became the bigger um, part of, uh, you know, th there was such a big increase there, but services were constrained much more so by closures and um, restaurants and you know, hotels and things like that not being used as um, much in their capacity. So now there's been improvement there, so that continues to be a positive thing. And so we'll see um, moving forward how it all works out. But, you know, after some slowdown now, hopefully um, consumption will pick up again later this year. Now on imports, we see you know a huge increase after COVID decline there in 2020. There was a you know a sharp drop off, but then they came back quite strongly, and the U.S. economy was buying more, and we were starting to get more shipped. Um, it, it, things were flowing into the U.S., and then there started to be a slowdown there in late 21. It looks like, and so we've we've seen a slowdown in um, ex or imports. Um, exports have been slowing too, but not nearly as much. So that um, makes it so that there's a relative improvement in our economic um, growth from having sl you know slower imports and exports kind of not slowing as much. So then the relative change is a positive for the U.S. economy. So we can see um, that in the earlier chart that there was still some positive um, net export. Um, contribution to growth for the whole U.S. So at the same time that we've seen some slowdown, we don't really see that in terms of the labor markets. They, they're still quite tight, and you can see that partly because there's been a return of people to the labor market after the COVID drop. This is the labor force participation rate, which had been on a long-term decline, and then um, then a, a spike, you know, then the plunge for COVID and then some modest recovery um, until, you know, 2022, you know, kind of flattened off. Um, and so the anticipation would be that the participation rate will continue to follow kind of the long-term trend of a downward trajectory. But at the same time, um, you know, the, it, it moves around a lot and you do have people that are returning from being on the sidelines to being willing to work in the, um, you know, you had a lot of re early retirements during COVID. You had people that were having to have child care um, issues, the elder care. And so there were a lot of needs that were, that people had that they couldn't go to work always. And at the same time, you know, you could maybe work at home some, but not in every case was that possible to um, be able to work at home. A lot of jobs didn't, you know, require you to be in a facility, in a manufacturing plant and things like that. So, um, so we, we, we have seen a um, return in the labor force participation, but at the same time, in the long run, at least, the anticipation is people like my, you know, I'm a late baby boomer, so those of us will start retiring before too long, and um, the other baby boomers are already, um, you know, a lot of them on the sidelines. So it's a, it's a, it's a period that the U.S. economy is going to have to face this continuing long-term trend. But for right now, um, you know, unemployment is as low as it's been in 50 years, 3.4% last month. So that's just, um, you know, amazing given the slowdowns we've had, the, the slower growth and the concern last year about already being in a recession, but the labor markets were not acting like it. And so we, we have had a lot of layoffs. 
um, at various kinds of companies, especially high tech companies. But they hired so much during the um, recession and the you know the COVID period that they um, you know even though they laying off some employees, they're still um, positive um, relative to where they were prior to that in terms of their employment. So employment rates are just extremely low and. You can see that the anticipation would be that with some slowdown, they might rise up towards the long run unemployment rate of 4% that's anticipated for the economy overall, but still, um, you know, still quite low after the huge spike during COVID and then the gradual declines we've had. So now not all educational levels are seeing the same benefits from that low unemployment rate. If you look, break it out by the amount of education employees have, you can see that if you have a bachelor degree or higher, your rate of unemployment is well below that of the others. And some college is, um, you know, is maybe um, you know, a little bit above that, n near where high school graduates are, the red line. But then if you have less than a high school degree, which is about 7% of the U.S. workforce, then you're, you're closer up to about 5%. But all those levels of education are declining. It's just that the ones with, as you have more education, the chances are that your unemployment rate is going to be much lower. So I, I think that shows the benefits of education, but at the same time that you know, the recovery is not equal across all um, different kinds of workers. So that's a challenge that um, needs to be looked at somewhat more in depth. Um, and not necessarily, um, you know, just by the Fed. Since our tools are kind of more broad, you know, we just have the um, Fed funds rate and other, um, you know, large aggregate kinds of approaches, not micro approaches to deal with those issues. But in, when you look at it overall, the number of unemployed workers is um, fewer than the number of job openings. So in this chart, um, you can see how the demand for workers has outstripped the supply of labor because there are more jobs available than there are unemployed workers. So then, um, you know, you start looking at, you know, the long run, you know, since the middle of 21, we've had this situation where um, there's, you know, high demand for workers because there's jobs available, but there just aren't that many unemployed people that are able to work. So. Um, so labor markets continue to be very tight, and it's led to a lot of increases in employment costs. If you look at wages and salaries, which is the green line in this chart, and the benefits, which is the red line, they've risen quite strongly in the last couple years. Uh, you can see they've been up over 5% last year at one point, even though they tailed off a little bit. Um, towards the end in benefits and um, wages were just slightly above 5% at the end of last year in terms of a change from a year ago. So those aren't all-time highs, but still, you know, they look pretty strong. But there's a big caveat, and that is that when you adjust for inflation in real terms, people weren't gaining anything last couple years. Um, it, you know, inflation took off and that took away the buying power of the American people as they were not able to, you know, the increases in wages and benefits didn't keep up with those increases in inflation and in prices. So, so that's a big challenge right now, and you can see that in this chart, you know, we have inflation that's been the highest since the 1980s, and it has started coming down. This is the Consumer Price Index, which was released yesterday again and showed a small decrease, but still a little over 6% for the um, overall um, increase from a year ago. Uh, and then when you take away food and energy, which is the blue line, that's a um, little under 6%. Um, and so that's kind of what we think of as called core inflation. Um, you, when you strip out some of those more volatile elements that gives you kind of a feel for you know where things might be headed a little more and there's even been now a super core discussed as in terms of if you um, take out some of the rental and look at more of the service side of things in terms of the um, the um, consumer price index and so there's still some concern that the you know the surface side is seeing stronger growth in um, jobs and that's um, leading to higher wages there that might continue to keep our um, prices at a higher level over a longer period so 
um, there's certainly some concern about how quickly the consumer price index might come down. And of course, some of the things that have contributed to um, lower prices recently um, have been that oil prices have been dropping in real terms. Um, since the middle of 2022, there was a spike in energy costs as Ukraine was struggling to fend off Russia. And then that led you know, to lots of um, issues with um, the sanctions you know, and the energy scenarios in Europe being um, very extreme particularly for natural gas. You can see there was a dramatic, dramatic increase um, last year in natural gas prices, but they've come down as well. So um, even though we might see some current increase in gas prices at the pump, um, heating homes and, um, you know, and, and then energy costs for industry have um, come down quite a bit in the recent um, you know, half year or so. so um, it didn't end up being as nearly a nasty scenario as um, many expected, and partly that was a um, you know less um, uh, you know cold winter in Europe in particular, and so there wasn't as big a need there. But you can see kind of how the U.S. is now much more um, intertwined with what's happening in other parts of the world. Something like natural gas. Uh, we used to be, you know, have, you know, for over a decade as we had fracking um, come into play and our own production of natural gas grew dramatically, then we had a period where um, natural gas prices didn't um, spike up all that much, you know, as they had prior, if you look back to 2008 and earlier, some of those big spikes there. And then last year it surprised people somewhat because um, not only were we producing less natural gas after COVID had slowed down some of the um, exploration, but then we also started exporting more of it to Europe because Europe really was in need of um, natural gas supplies. They were trying to replace those that they'd lost with Russia. And so there was a big spike there. And so now, um, you know, we're able to export more liquefied natural gas. And so that's a boom for our exports, but at the same time, it's led to slightly higher and maybe even more than that um, increases in prices for um, domestic natural gas. So now energy costs have come down, so that's helping to slow inflation. And it's, um, you know, and inflation's coming down. Here you can see um, the personal consumption expenditure index, which is, um, this is the core version, so it takes out food and energy. But that one is anticipated to be moving down towards the um, longer term trend um, you know, of around 2% in the next few years, according to S&P Global. Um, the blue chip forecast, you know, another group of, um, of economists that make forecasts and they combine them together. They have a forecast of 2.4% inflation from a year ago for Q4 of 2023. And then, you know, that's getting reasonably close to the Fed's target of 2% for the overall personal consumption expenditure index. So uh, it seems like we're making progress, but it's too soon to call the end of um, rate hikes, as I'll mention a little later, too. Now, shifting a little bit to thinking about more local um, outlook, here you can see the United States um, change in payroll employment index. So in 2020, it was 100. Um, you know, so this is not the total number of jobs, but it's the change um, based on the, the changes in jobs. And you can see how in uh, February, March, and April, there was such a decline in the jobs um, for the nation, the dark um, um, black line, and then Illinois it was the blue line, and all the other states are the many other lines there. So this is some work that Tom has done. And you can you know, see the recovery. Um, Illinois was slightly um, behind the United States in recovering, um, partly because I guess you would anticipate that given that some of the um, closures lasted a little bit longer in Illinois. And then there's been generally um, good progress for the U.S. overall, slightly above where we were prior to the pandemic in terms of employment. Um, Illinois is still below its pre-pandemic level of employment. So um, the local outlook is being driven by longer run fundamentals as well. Um, the initial shock, it, it, you know, has pretty much passed, but at the same time, um, there, you know, the states that had the worst of the 
um, recovery in terms of the, you know, the levels are, are ones that maybe had higher shares of leisure and hospitality employment. Um, and so there, there, there are some things holding back Illinois' employment levels, and that's something that if you look at this next chart, you'll see that you know, we're really in kind of the longer term, barely into the third quartile. So you break the U.S. employment um, in terms of pre-pandemic growth, and the blue is the first quartile, the states that were growing the fastest, and then the second and third are the middle 50%, and the fourth are the lowest. So Illinois was just above those lowest, and so it's really um, kind of been slow growth for Illinois for a longer time, and they're still in that kind of a, a position coming out of the um, COVID time period. And so it's a, it's a challenging time. Um, you know, the, the growth may not be as strong. Um, it may take longer to get to the level of jobs that we had prior to the pandemic. Um, and, and at the same time, that fits in with the longer pattern. So, so that's some challenging um, issues for the states in you know, the Midwest. It's not just Illinois, but others as well have um, faced some of those um, kinds of patterns that need to be dealt with longer term. So now let's transition to a little bit about what the Federal Open Market Committee sees happening in the economy. This is the organization in the Federal Reserve that makes the decisions on when and how much to increase interest rates or to decrease them. And the Federal Open Market Committee has um, uh, every other cycle, they meet eight times a year, so every other meeting, they, so, every, so four times a year they come up with a forecast of what they anticipate is happening with the U.S. economy. And here you can see that and the most, this is actually from December still, and there'll be a new release in March um, with the um, next meeting of the FOMC. The expectation at the end of 2022 was that we were gonna have the personal consumption expenditure index inflation rate be about five and a half percent, and that's pretty much where it ended up. And then the anticipation would be it'd be falling down towards around 3% this year, and 2% um, in the longer run. Now, the way to read this in terms of these little charts is they're, they have little um, stems on them to show, you know, based on the reddish line, which is the median, the middle um, voter on the FOMC, and then the um, little line showed how, you know, the range was. And so the range is coming down for, um, you know, expectations of inflation, but some think a little faster than others. And so the voters um, include my new boss, um, President Goolsby. He um, took over last year from Charles Evans, or last month, excuse me. And so he, he now is a voting member, as well as um, the Board of Governors and the other 12 Federal Reserve Bank presidents are all the members that are um, pegging these values here. So inflation is headed down in terms of the expectations, um, you know, hopefully faster than um, you know, maybe um, some are thinking, but at the same time, still um, headed towards that 2% target over time. And in order to, you know, have a scenario where that's, um, you know, possible to have that kind of decline, we need to have some lower um, demand in the economy. The economy has been so strong that it was, um, you know, that it was um, growing, you know, gangbusters. And so when that happens, Inflation can pick up. We, you know, we had kind of some supply issues with, you know, COVID, and so that was a real um, challenge. So, 2021, we had a huge spurt of growth for the economy, increasing over five percent. And then 2022, it fell back, and we don't have the final number yet, but still um, quite a bit lower for, um, you know, and and more little between uh, under one percent probably is the expectation here. Um, based on, you know, we had three quarters of the data at that time. And then rising up towards its longer run increase, which is about 1.8% um, in the long run. So that's the anticipation, you know, not a recession, but at the same time, there is a possibility of some downward um, quarters here, as, as we've seen in the um, last few years, too, sometimes. But at the same time that we have, um, you know, such a... Um, slower growth period, we also 
would anticipate unemployment rising some, you know, not getting up to the peaks we saw during the COVID times, but certainly uh, moving up from the very, very low rates at it, you know, what it is right now. Finally, when you think about how we're going to achieve something like this, which often is called the, um, you know, soft landing, um, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, what the Federal Reserve is hoping for, but at the same time, it, it, it's hard to achieve. So we'll see um, what happens there. The Federal Open Market Committee in December of 2021 anticipated this sort of uh, increase in the Fed funds rate. So this is um, when there was starting to be some pretty, um, you know, big concerns about inflation. So the Fed was starting to look at increasing interest rates. And this is typically called the dot plot because each dot represents one voting member or one member of the Federal Open Market Committee's views. And so at the end of 2021, expectation, you know, interest rates would stay low then and then in 20. Um, you know, and then over time, they'd start rising up towards the longer run, which is around 2.5% um, there. So, so we were anticipating that, you know, there'd be moving up from 0 to 2.5%, and then we'd see that everything was working well, you know, in terms of, you know, kind of, a, you know, having a, you know, a increase in economic activity, but at the same time not having um, huge inflationary pressures. Now, when you look at what happened in... 2022 at the end of the year, not only had we already moved above that 2.5% longer run level, we were up close to 4.5% in terms of the Fed funds rate target. So in that one year period, inflation reared its ugly head and um, had to be um, attacked in terms of the main tool that the Fed had for monetary policy, which is the increasing the Fed funds rate target. So, um, you know, a huge shift in perspective, and now the anticipation would be that um, there needs to be somewhat more of an increase. We've already had one increase this year, but it was a smaller one of 25 basis points, and so that's moved us up closer to 5% on interest rates, and we'll probably get there at the next meeting, although um, we don't know exactly the timing on increases this year. Um, the Fed o Open Market Committee is data dependent, and so um, depending on what's happening, um, they could increase a little faster again, or they could just maintain the slower pace of increases after last year's very rapid increases. But the Fed Open Market Committee anticipates to keep raising rates up towards five and a quarter, five and a half percent, somewhere in there, before then starting to lower them um, next year and the year after. So moving down towards the long run as inflation starts to ease more and we start having um, inflation down towards the 2% target, which, um, you know, we had inflation very low for a long time, so now um, having inflation high for a little while is not, um, you know, something that was unanticipated, but at the same time, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, unexpected in how quickly it did come. So that's giving you kind of the perspective of the Fed. And at the same time, we'd be very happy for you to share your knowledge with us. This um, little, um, you know, dinosaur um, logo there is something that leads you to our Chicago Fed survey of um, business conditions. And probably some of you have already been filling that out, but if you um, haven't and are interested in doing so, please get in touch. You can come up and talk to me, or you can um, find us on our website. So that gives us a lot of helpful information and um, brings us more knowledge on what's happening locally, which is of big value to us. And that's my, you know, my remarks. I'd be very happy to take some questions. Questions? Well, the Phillips curve still exists, but it's a, a theoretical construct that has not been so helpful lately. And so the Phillips curve, um, you know, in the 1970s when it was developed, was very helpful in thinking about these trade-offs of inflation and unemployment. But the economy's changed in the last 50 years, and so there have been a lot of things with the knowledge economy and information technology that's 
really changed, I think, a lot of the effectiveness of viewing that as a tool. And so there's a, still a lot of research on that. I'm not an expert on macroeconomics, but then in a nutshell, it's just not as useful for thinking about the economy. I'm going to cheat because uh, I have one question, but this question made me think of a second one. Okay. <laughs> the first I have is if two thirds of the economy is based on service, why is so much of our tax policy focused on investment, um, particularly around real estate? I don't understand what's going to be self The second is with all of your projections going forward, how have you guys accounted for artificial intelligence and automation as a driver in changing the pain of the economic? Well, you wanted to give me all the easy questions, right? <laughs> um, AI and um, technology, of course, are going to explode. Um, you know, we can see a little bit of the, you know, beginnings of how that's affecting things, and you know, in terms of search engines, and I mean, and obviously businesses are using it and new, and you know, and there's going to be lots of innovations. So I think um, you know, it doesn't necessarily come into play in our forecast directly. But you have to be thinking in the long run that you know, there's a lot of challenges in implementing that, but at the same time, a lot of opportunities. So that's going to be um, interesting to see how those dynamics play out you know, with robotics and things like that starting to have a bigger role and a lot of companies seeing you know, the shortage of labor that we have and we're anticipating having even um, you know, you know, the next, you know, after the baby boomers, the next generation is smaller. So there's going to be fewer workers and we need to come up with new technologies and be smart in how we use those workers. So hopefully everybody gets a good education and, you know, not necessarily college because technical community colleges can give you all the education you need to be part of the economy. But, you know, you, you, just, you just can't stand um, still. You have to be learning and um, those kind of things will come to play. In terms of tax policies, there's a lot of things that happen at the state and local levels that aren't necessarily um, you know, based on the mix of what's happening. It might be from 50 years ago thinking, and so there, we maybe need to update our, you know, our um, tax policies, but that's not something that I'm going to be able to um, really get into today. Where does the Fed feel about the U.S. dollar value? We think it's a strong value, you know. We, 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 we take dollars from the federal government and we put them into circulation and they, they have a, um, you know, they're, they're still the world standard. And so the value, you know, of the dollar itself in terms of other currencies is something the U.S. Treasury Department is um, part of their portfolio. So um, the Secretary of Treasury um, handles that. And so the Fed does not have a specific position on the value of the dollar relative to other currencies. But it, you know, the U.S. dollar has been strong, so that's been a, a little bit of a headwind on our exports. But we've still maintained our exports pretty well in the last um, year um, relative to our imports. So you would think we, you know, given where the dollar's been, maybe it would have been the reverse. So that's a, a little bit surprising. Another question? Well, that's not something I can really um, comment on. Is um, you know, my president is the one that you know it's his responsibility to talk about that kind of issue. Um, but what I will say is that you know many of the other um, leaders, I think you know, have been talking. You know, the Fed presidents, you know, have been speaking to the press, and it, it seems like there's still um, you know plenty of support for uh, you know an additional quarter point increase. Probably not so much for a half, you know, because um, the data maybe wasn't as much of a slowdown in inflation as people would have liked to see, but still it's headed in the right direction. So um, if we're going to have, as the Federal Open Market Committee has um, shown in their projections, that, you know, maybe five and a half point you know, percent is where we top out, 
if that's where we top out, we, we, you know, we're getting close. So a couple more quarter percent increases would get us there. We don't need to rush it with a 50 probably. I think we got time for one more. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So I would first of all like to thank uh, the DoubleTree for the great job they did uh, in the staff uh, for a wonderful meal. And uh, I've just got a couple of brief announcements. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge some elected officials in the room. Uh, uh, Mayor John Ryan uh, of ELSIP, who's... Uh, you, you can't have a better friend of manufacturing uh, in ELSIP. Uh, I, I know Mayor Ryan and what he does in this town, and there is no better host um, uh, for manufacturers that welcomes industry in. I think his middle name is give them the 6B and get them in here. You know, so, uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Mayor Ryan. And also is... Um, Denise here from the ELSIP Industrial Association? No, but uh, ELSIP Industrial Association, by the way, good organization that we partner with. Um, and uh, uh, would like, you know, just acknowledge them. Uh, and then my alderman uh, from the ninth ward, Alderman Tony Beal. <laughs> uh, okay, now. And, and now that we're, and have to prove that we're nonpartisan, we have Tony Ferraro from uh, U.S. Senator uh, Mike Braun's office from the state of Indiana. <laughs> I've done this before at a luncheon to prove that, you know, we're nonpartisan. I'm a trade union Democrat hired by a bunch of Republicans, so, uh, you know, in this job about 15 years ago, so. Uh, and that's the truth, so I'm very grateful for that. But uh, upcoming events, we're going to be back here in ELSIP um, as a guest of the ELSIP Industrial Association on the 12th, and I guess we are going to be doing a thing on workforce development resources for manufacturing, so it'll be a joint uh, effort with uh, the Calumet Area Industrial Commission and the ELSIP Industrial Association. If you are located in ELSIP, I would suggest you join the uh, ELSIP Industrial Association. They have a lot of good information and they can help you out. We're not competitors of theirs. Um, we work jointly together like we do with the Bedford Park Clearing Industrial Association. I don't know what is going on on 127th and Cicero, but, but they sure do know what's going on here like the Bedford Park Industrial Association will telling me what's going on on 79th and Okito, and I rely on them uh, to, to keep me informed. So these uh, other industrial associations are uh, good to be members of. Uh, so that's coming up on the 12th. The other thing that we have coming up with the Calumet Area Industrial Commission, we are going to have BP, which is a member. I don't think they're here today, are, are they? No. Um, they. Uh, 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 they will be uh, doing a presentation sometime in either March or April. We're trying to get a date. Their, their economists will be coming out from D.C. to give us an idea of where oil prices are going. And I think most everyone realizes it's not only the price of gasoline that's affected, but whether plastics and everything else that from fossil fuels are affected uh, by what happens with the price of oil. So in manufacturing, that affects everything that we use daily. So um, we're going to get their economist out, and I've heard him speak before, and he's very knowledgeable on what, what, we're, what we're facing in uh, oil prices. Also, I've heard the uh, uh, 
Illinois Environmental Protection Agency uh, uh, director speak uh, at the Illinois Manufacturers Association. He's agreed to come out and speak. We may end up with both of them coming out separately, of course, uh, doing uh, in April, or if we can, we're going to split them up between March and uh, April, um, and depending on how their schedules work. But that will be upcoming, and and um, and we'll let you know on the dates as, as that comes out. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight, a nice crowd, and I'd like to thank my wonderful staff for always making me look good in spite of myself, and uh, have a wonderful week. Thank you.